Brakes are good. Good brakes are great. But do you know your barb from your olive? Do you know your mineral from your dot? Do you know your two pot from a four pot? If you don't and you'd like to know more, well, I'm here to help with a deep dive into the anatomy of a brake. Modern brakes can seem really complex, but it's actually lots of old science. And well, it might be old science, there is a lot of high tech in them. But before we begin, I just wanna ask really nicely, if you could subscribe, it makes a really big difference to us to provide even more in-depth content just like this. Brakes, a system to arrest speed using friction. Early mountain bike brakes were touring or BMX hand-me-downs where we're using a lever on the handlebars, pulling a cable which pulled some contraption and linkage and pulled rubber pads onto the rims. Now, they worked really well, even though they're hand-me-down. Now, we should say Charlie Cunningham made some really incredible brakes, some linear pull and toggle cam brakes that worked really powerfully, much better than the, the canty brakes and cantilever brakes that we had. But about the same time as those brakes were coming out, Shimano developed its first V-brakes, which were really innovative and very powerful. About the same time though, the first iteration of disc brakes came along. And ever since then, so about 20 years in now, we've had disc brakes as the gold standard of brakes. We now moved to hydraulic as the standard and that's what we're going to talk about today. So the basics, we're going to use a lever on the handlebar which pushes fluid down a hose into the caliper which then pushes pistons against pads and pads against rotors and it's this friction that slows us down. A byproduct of which is lots of heat so heat management for disc brakes is really important. So we mentioned old science, and I do mean old science. We go back to the ancient Greek, the original OG Greek geek, Archimedes. Yep, the guy that jumped in the bath and as the bath water sloshed out, he shouted Eureka because he'd worked out one of the early principles of hydraulics. And I'll quote you from him. He says, a liquid is a nearly incompressible fluid that conforms to the shape of its container, but retains nearly constant volume independent of pressure. I know it, it's a lot, but what it means is that we can have something that's almost friction free and we're using the fluid to transfer the force. So when you pull the lever, you're pushing a little bit of fluid down into the caliper and that pushes out the pads. It's really clever stuff. Okay, we're sticking with the Greek geek Archimedes with a wonderful quote, which I'll read so I don't muck it up. Give me a lever and a place to stand my feet and I will move the earth. I'm not sure he was thinking about brake levers, but that's where we're starting. Levers come in lots of different flavors and varieties, even with hydraulic brakes. And now, depending on the lever shape, they can be one finger, two finger, or even three finger designed. And a lot of that comes down to, well, Shimano or SRAM designing those brake levers a little bit to interface with their different shifters, because a long time SRAM used to make grip shift. Um, but a lot of it's just down to the designer's desires to make a shorter, more compact lever setup. For example, Magura gives you the option to have different brake levers. So you can have a one finger, a two finger, a really adjustable lever that you can change the angle with. So there's lots out there. Some of these lever designs, like Magora's, are a single pivot. Others, like SRAM and Shimano, use a multi-pivot and roller bearings and different assemblies. Now, where the pivot is and how these linkages move are gonna affect how much fluid is pushed and what rate that fluid is pushed through. And that's important because depending on where that volume changes, so if there's more volume at the end, for example, it means that the pistons are gonna push in with more force towards the end, so you'll get better braking. Lever bodies and levers are often made from aluminium alloys. Why? Because they need to be strong. Magora uses their Carbotecture high-tech polymer, often with a metal lever, but they also do carbon levers. Now, other brands do carbon levers too, and it's often to save weight for XC racers. So you've got the same strength as a metal one, but lighter. Obviously, it's not lighter on your wallet. The lever pushes a piston, and that piston forces fluid into the hose, and that helps actuate, through the hydraulic action, the brake. Most designs now have a reservoir because they're sort of an open style brake, and that helps with heat management because sometimes as the brake can heat up, 
that heat can travel up from the rotor and the pads and effectively heat up the oil inside them. And it's very subtle, but with the reservoir it helps absorb this expansion. Bigger brakes for DH and Enduro will often have bigger reservoirs for this purpose. Many levers will have some kind of reach adjustment. It could be a dial that you can use on the fly or it might need a hex key to adjust. And effectively that's to tailor the brake lever position to your ergonomic requirements. So thanks to that friction-free power, the hose doesn't really matter, does it? Well, not quite. If we go back to what Archimedes was saying about how hydraulics work, we've got to balance things. So effectively, we need to contain the fluid so any flex doesn't result in a loss of power. So the problem for brake brands is that they need to create a hose that's flexible enough that you can slide it around the tightest of turns and kinks in a frame, whether that be externally rooted or internally, but provide the perfect stiffness so you don't get lots of power loss during a lever. I think most brands get this balance just right. The pressure that the lever can transfer onto the fluid is surprisingly high, so all those connections between the lever and the hose and the hose and the caliper need to be really strong. To connect the lever to the hose and the hose to the caliper, you need some ultra-specific parts. They're often called a barb and olive. They're not edible, but we'll talk about them. The barb is a strengthening insert. We'll go into details of why it needs to be so strong later, but they're either pressed in with a dedicated tool or they're threaded in. They're often made of brass or steel or even aluminium alloy in some cases. The olive, this is a type of crush washer. So as you might imagine, it is single use because it will be crushed into an interface fit. So it slides on, the hose slides in between it, a nut goes on behind it, and it all crushes and fits into your lever. Now, we'll go back to why that barb needs to be strengthening. That's to reinforce the hose. So as this crush washer fits around really tightly around the hose, it doesn't pinch the hose and reduce the fluid flow at all. Some systems use a crimped at the factory banjo at the caliper end. Now, it's called a banjo because it looks, well, not dissimilar to the musical instrument. These offer a little bit more rotational adjustment with the hose, and they are factory fitted, so you can't refit them. The caliper, this is the chunky bit down by your wheel axles. This is designed to hold the pistons and the pads, and push those pads evenly. The pistons within the caliper body can be made of, well, lots of different things, depending on the application. So they can be made from just regular metal, they can be made from fiber reinforced polymers, or in some cases, ceramic, all in an effort to try and reduce any heat transfer from the really hot bits of the braking system, which is the pads and the rotor. For more aggressive riding, it's often that you'll have more pistons. So up from a two pot to a four pot and even six pot. Oh, and pot is just short for piston. Now there is some logic to consider that a more piston brake will be more powerful, but I think it's a bit more nuanced than that because some designs will use different size pistons in the same brake. They'll push in evenly, so you'll have paired smaller ones and paired larger ones. And depending on the lever configuration with, it, with its linkage, it can mean that the pads will actuate at slightly different rates. I also think that, yes, these number of pistons can be indicative to a little bit more power, but I think it's probably also down to, well, pad size, because often these larger six-pot or four-pot brakes have larger pads, and that's more surface area, so hopefully more friction. The shape and size of the caliper will depend on how many pistons are in it, and it will depend on the design and how it's been manufactured. Some are one piece, so they're really light. Some are bolted together. Now, it's not just to make it cheaper, it's often to add more mass, because more of that mass can help absorb heat and take away any of the heat contact points, so hopefully manage all the heat better. The mounting hardware can often be different for different applications. Many XC bikes are using a roadie standard, which is called flat mount. It's a little bit lighter and a slightly smaller caliper, but it is a different standard. Now, standards aside, all the systems are gonna do a similar thing, which is bolt by fixed bolts, the caliper to the frame or to the fork lower with some adjustment. And that adjustment is key to make sure that the pads can run parallel to the rotor for maximum braking. Housing the caliper and pushed by the pistons is the critical part of the braking system, the pads. Made up of a backing plate, which is often metal, and then a high friction pad material. The backing plates can be made of, well, often steel, but you can get alloy, 
aluminium ones and you can get titanium alloy ones as well. Now, some of it's to do with weight saving. Some of it is to do with heat management. Pad materials can be split into two groups, organic and resin and sintered and metal. Metal and sintered pads have a much higher metal content and they can provide much better braking in wet and gritty conditions. They can last a lot longer, even if they are a little bit noisier. And on a well-bled brake system can provide a subtly stiffer lever feel. Resin or organic pads have a lower metal content. They're a little bit softer. So in wet and gritty conditions, they might not last as long, but they're much, much quieter. And on a well bled brake system, they can provide a subtly softer lever feel. The pads and rotors need to be paired and not in a Bluetooth way, but in a bedding in process. And this is really critical because you're gonna add some of the brake material that's on the pad to the rotor and it really boosts braking power. Part of this bedding in process is also really critical to bring the pads up to temperature. And it means that you can have the pads for longer because they'll last longer because opposed to being aggressively heated on one downhill run, you're gonna slowly bring them up to temperature, which helps cure and finish the pads off as well as matching the rotor to the pads, so bedding in is an essential. Many brands have contact adjustment at the lever. This effectively changes where the pads sit relative to the rotor and changes the system's bite point. This is subtly different, but it is different from lever reach adjustment. This is the rotating braking surface mounted to the wheel. There's two main standards for mounting it. You've got center lock, which is a Shimano developed system where it's just got one bolt or one nut to lock it on the wheel, or you've got six bolt where, yeah, you've got six bolts to mount it on. Most often rotors are made from steel, and this is because it's a really good material. It's got really good brake characteristics of heat management and wear rates, but there are lots of other options out there too. Lots of brands use a two-piece setup where you've got a floating inner rotor where you may stamp or bolt on an outer braking surface, and this is to save weight, because as rotors get bigger, if it's just all made out of steel, they can be quite heavy. Now, some brands use floating rotors, which, well, on a motorbike side, they are truly floating, so they can move and wiggle a little bit because when you've got the force of a motor to push stuff along, a little bit of brake rub is okay. But in real sense, as a only semi-floating in the mountain bike market, and they allow a little bit of movement front to back. It might be confusing, but these can help with heat management because the rotor is not fully connected to the inner section. It means that it can expand and allow a little bit of movement and a better heat management. There's some other heat management tricks out there too. So Galfa, a Spanish brand that makes lots of rotors and other braking stuff, again for the motorsports and power sports industry, have patented a wavy rotor. Now, lots of other brands have got similar stuff. And essentially by increasing the size of the rotor, it means you've got more surface area for more cooling. Now, Galfa is quite clever because they also have a wave where it cleans the pads, but there's lots of different options out there. Other brands use a sandwiching of different materials in the same rotor material. So most famously Shimano with their IceTech rotors where they're using an aluminium core with some steel on the outside, all to boost braking. And I might sound a little agnostic on some of these things as if they don't really work, but one thing that definitely works is bigger rotors. Anna's done a great video on how upping your rotor size can up your power. Do you need all the power? Well, maybe not, because if you've locked your wheel up, well, you're not getting any more traction. So managing what size rotors you need and what size you want are two probably different things. We've talked about hydraulic systems and fluids are key to any hydraulic system. The hydraulic fluids that are used in a brake system have to be really consistent because they've got to flow the same nearly all the time because any changes to that viscosity are gonna change how the lever feels. As fluids heat up, as they try and change from one state to another, they change in volume. And for lever feel, that's really detrimental. Some of those attributes can be designed out with a larger reservoir, so there's more fluid or other heat management techniques. But one of the key ones is using a hydraulic fluid that's got a really high boiling point. With mountain bike brakes, we've got two main fluids that are used. We've got mineral oils and we've got dot fluids. Both of them can come in wild energy drink colorways, both of them are quite toxic, but that's where the similarities end. DOT fluid, which stands for Department of Transport, comes in three different sort of flavors. I say sort of, because essentially the fluid is the same. They've just got subtly different 
boiling point and subtly different attitude. So we've got a dot three, a dot four and a dot five. So if you've got a dot system, you could interchange those different fluid numbers in them, but you shouldn't really mix them. The fluid is really special because it's hydroscopic and that means it can absorb water, which can be problematic. Problematic for storage long term and slightly problematic if you've got a slightly dicky seal on your brake because over time air might creep in and in that air the fluid may change volume as it absorbs the water inside it. So it can be really good, it's got a really high boiling point but you've got to deal with it really carefully because it's both toxic and corrosive. So treat it with gloves literally. The dedicated seals and all of the innards of the brake, be the piston seals or the lever piston seals, are all designed to work with either dot fluid or mineral fluid. They're not cross compatible. Mineral fluids, now this sounds like a coverall for lots, but actually they're all slightly different. So Shimano has its own, Magora's got its own royal blood, TRP has its own, and now SRAM has its own via lubricant manufacturer Maxim. All of them have got really similar properties in terms of, again, quite high boiling points, a relatively low viscosity, but key, they're not hydroscopic. So they're not gonna absorb moisture from the air. They're not gonna change volume over time. And that means that in the brake and in your workshop where you're storing them means it's a lot easier to store and they should last a lot longer. Similarly to DOT, they are relatively toxic. So you've got to handle them with care and dispose of them carefully. Designs can vary wildly, and that's because designers are tuning their brakes for different applications within the sport. And I know it sounds daft, but we'll give some examples now. An XC brake is gonna be designed to be as light as possible. XC races aren't doing huge long downhills, so the designers don't have to have really big burly calipers to mount lots of pistons, so they'll often just be two piece. Due to the designs of the frames, they'll often be flat mount as well to, to minimize the size. Other things that may change as well is the lever. It might be a little bit shorter, it might be smaller, and it might forego any adjusters to reach or bite point. The opposite side of the scale is we've got downhill and enduro. So the brakes here need to be able to manage lots and lots of heat. So calipers are gonna be really big. They might be a bolted construction. They are probably gonna be at least a four pot because we need really big pads for lots and lots of friction. Now the lever, it's gonna to have to have lots of adjustment. It might have more leverage, so the lever might be longer. You might have more adjustments. It's always horses for courses though. So get the brake that suits your riding the most. Hopefully this video has been helpful. Please comment if you'd like us to do more videos on more deep dives about the anatomy of your mountain bike. And well, yeah, hopefully just head out for a ride.